Hey, rock stars, this is Lidge. And I record these interviews well in advance. And so occasionally when they come out, we sadly lose some people that we really love and some people that are important to us. And so before I do this interview with Greg Norman, who I met at Electrical Audio when I was up there working with Steve Albini um, in Studio A and Studio B, we've sadly lost Steve recently. And so uh, I want to dedicate this episode to Steve Albini and um, to his family and friends and to all the folks up at Electrical Audio. Steve was a huge influence on me and my career and many of us. In fact, his interviews here on this podcast are the highest listens of any interview that we have. So I'll include those links as well in the show notes if you want to go check out some of the interviews with Steve after hearing this one with Greg. I hope you enjoy this episode with Greg. We do talk about Steve and electrical audio some. This episode is dedicated to you, Steve. Thanks so much for everything you've done for us. Cheers. This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Adam Audio, Isotope, Native Instruments, Lewitt, and Grace Design. You're hearing my voice right now on the new Lewitt Ray microphone with Aura, Auto Gain, and EQ mode through the Grace Design M201 Mark II Mic Pre mixed through Isotope, Voice Enhancement Assistant RX, Ozone, Neutron, and Nectar on Atom Audio Monitors. Please check out our awesome sponsors using the links in the show notes. It's a great way to help support this show. Now get ready to rock. Back to the digital versus analog thing. I've noticed that when drummers are playing with the mindset that we're piecing this together to make a whole song, there's much less intensity and more like going through the motions and less like I'm playing this song. I want to play it as good as I can play it. I want to play it like I want to play it. I want it to be heard. It's sort of like, all right, let me just run through that part like six more times to see what we come up with. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. In 2024, Adam Audio celebrates 25 years of designing industry-leading monitors in Berlin, unveiling the Arctic White A4V and A7V series, available for a limited time. With the XART ribbon tweeter design, customizable speaker voicings, and Sonarworks integration for room correction, these monitors deliver professional-grade sound perfect for Grammy-winning producers and home studios. Make your studio cool Cooler than cool with the Arctic White series and get the Atom Audio A4V and A7V with an extended five-year warranty at AdamAudio.com. Are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble figuring out how to get your mixes to sound great? Do they sound kind of weak or distant or lack punch and clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding much closer to professional mixes. And it's my free course called Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins in Pro Tools, and the best part is that these mixing techniques work for you in any DAW, whether you're on Logic, Cubase, Studio One, Reaper, anything you can think of. If you're ready now to make your best record ever, then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, and you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Greg Norman, a recording producer, engineer, and studio technician based out of Chicago, Illinois. Greg has been on the podcast before for episode RSR 14 quite a while ago, so we're very glad to have him back now. In 1996, Greg started working at Electrical Audio, initially aiding in the design and construction of the two-studio complex on the north side of Chicago. A few years later, he built his own studio to keep up with the demands of recording projects outside of Electrical. Over the years, he's recorded over 100 records as a staff member of Electrical, 
and traveled abroad as a freelance producer and engineer. Greg has also designed, consulted, and installed several studios in Chicago throughout the States and Canada. He's got unique expertise in analog tape and console design and maintenance, which has become a dying art hopefully not dying too much. He's also into designing and manufacturing custom recording studio equipment. And as I mentioned, he's been a guest on the show before. So please check out that previous episode to hear more about Greg's backstory, getting into music and recording, and also to listen to his awesome sounding discography. And that link is below in the show notes. So please welcome back Greg Norman to Recording Studio Rockstars. Greg, are you ready to rock again, dude? I believe so. (laughs) All right, cool, man. Do you do you enjoy the over over the topness of it of the intro? Yeah, it's uh, I, I was waiting, I was prepared for another half hour of it. That was pre- pretty awesome. I wanted to hear about right. it, I'll do it and everything. <laughs> well, at least I didn't list every record in your discography. That might have taken us a minute. Yeah, that, that might that would be compelling. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, where are you joining us from now? You are you at home in your studio, or where are you? I am. I'm in the uh, so I. Uh, about eight years ago, um, my wife and I bought a uh, an abandoned two flat in Logan Square in Chicago, right at the end of the uh, housing crisis explosion. And we lucked out and got nice. two flat, and we uh, sort of rebuilt it from the ground up. And we live in the top floor apartment and rent out one of the apartments in the first floor. And then in the basement, I'd sort of finished out to be my shop and moved my studio from the south side to that basement. And pretty much all I can do in this new basement is a uh, mixing and some light overdubs. And the idea would be was that, okay, we got this cool building and we're going to be here for a couple of years and then find a new house. And I'm going to set up my new studio in the new house. And that'll be like, you know, two or three years. And we've been here about eight years. <laughs> so Nice. And so your tenants move in and you're like, I hope you like rock and roll sandwich. Cause yeah, it's like the studio's below you and I'll be listening to the mixes after at the end of the day, right above you. <laughs> and you're going to get a hammering from my children running back and forth in this little apartment. And, <laughs> and you're going to hear like throbbing noises from below from the speakers. And yeah, it's, nice. it's part of a pre pre-screening process. Whenever there's a tenant coming in, it's like, all right, so I I try to keep it, you know, at nine o'clock I'll shut things down, but it, there, you'll hear music and it'll be repetitive. <laughs> it won't be, yeah, won't be like a nice little playlist. It'll be like snare drum, snare drum, snare drum, snare drum, <laughs> and it'll be the same song for several hours and that kind of stuff. Or it'll be the sound of like a desoldering gun, which sounds like a, a moaning cow, <laughs> right? And with the occasional. Yeah. Oh no, those are the hand ones that do that. Uh, yeah, it's more like a, a a weird. It's like dental equipment kind of sounding thing. Um, know. you know, it's funny because like you, it really speaks to me because I also rented the upstairs of my house for like eight years. I'd have roommates, and I think sometimes as musicians and studio people, we might start by thinking. Oh, how's this going to blend well with somebody, you know, like we, we need to rent because, you know, you, a lot of times doing music and doing studio stuff, you need to be very, very flexible with your income possibilities. And then on the other hand, we might be wondering like, how are we going to do that? But same as you, I just would like place an ad and be like, you know, renting to musician friendly household. It's like, if you're a musician and you need to practice, well, you'll be like right at home here Uh, uh, kind of thing. Definitely. I, I, we had some good tenants for like seven years or like, it's insane how long they were here for. Like when you look back out, how, how fast things move. And obviously it sort of mirrored the progression of my children growing up. So like, it, it was just interesting. They left last summer and we had our first chance to sort of go in there and kind of clean things up and do a couple of things we've been holding off for a while. And it, and and then list the apartment again. And I was like, should I tell my musician friends or should I just do this the open world? <laughs> it's like I like I like having the like the musician community and being close to it, but also like I don't necessarily want to have <laughs> like music coming through my floor. I don't know. So it was it was right. an interesting sort of situation. But um and we ended up with some like nice people who moved into the city for the first time, which is always kind of fun seeing seeing the city of Chicago through new eyes, like, and their, their experience is kind of funny, but. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I ended up doing that too, like making an actual Craigslist ad and just spelling it all out. Yep. And it's like, it's almost like opening a studio, you know, it's the, it's that nervousness of putting 
your rates on the website for the first time or something like that, where you're like, you know, you, you, you're afraid if you reveal too much, it's not going to work, but, <laughs> but it can, it can. Yeah. And I had musicians practicing upstairs and I, you know, I'd, I'd have to tell them like, Hey man, I, I love that you're practicing your pedal steel, but maybe you should not place it right above my bed. Maybe you should move it over to the other side of the room. Oh, yeah. It all works out. That's cool. Yeah. As long as people are cool and communicate, it should work out. Okay. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, kind of like making records, right? Yeah, exactly. A record, but in this case, you're making a record with someone for like a twelve month lease or <laughs> <laughs> twelve month record. Uh, oh, it's like old school again. Exactly, like Fleetwood Mac. That's how they, you know. But so, tell us about your studio, man. What, what's your studio like? So, I with with the the idea in mind that it'd be like leapfrogging to my imagined future studio. I kept hold of my big old analog console, which is a Sony MXP 3000 console, which I love. It's I've had that since 2006, I think, or 2005. And mm-hmm. I, have, I have my Studer 822 2-inch tape machine and my half-inch Studer A80 machine. All this like big gear, all my microphones, all my mic stands, all this stuff like, okay, I'm going to be tracking again, so I got to keep this stuff. And like, uh, really like, there there should have been sort of like a about five years in I, I, where I was just realizing I'm doing a lot of remote mixing or like recalling, you know, like doing all the mixing in the box a lot more often where, yeah. I, where it's just like I'm using, I'm doing that thing where I'm using either stereo stems or just one stereo output to just maintain simplicity. And, uh, and then I got this big honking console that's, you know, 650 watts <laughs> like and, and heating the room I'm like, I really should not be having that. <laughs> I should not be using this board for what I'm doing. But but I love it's it. It's good in Chicago in the winter, though, right? It's great. It, generally, generally speaking, I can turn off the heat in the basement when I have that console on. It's a big old radiator. But um, uh, it, yeah, it's I'm keeping it with the idea that like, because it's going to be super handy when I'm tracking again, you know, wherever I end up. But uh, I think if I was like cold blooded and a little more cunning, I probably would have offloaded, you know, some of the bigger, heavier duty stuff. But I'm just like everybody else, I'm addicted to this things and I don't yeah. <laughs> I don't let go of stuff that easily. Do you still do some tracking? I barely like they'll once in a while they'll be like, we'll get done with like a project. My my routine lately has been a track at a at electrical or another studio and then we'll, you know, mix at my place. And uh usually there's some booger overdubs left over to do and what i try to do is prioritize you know you know leave all the easy to easy stuff to do at my house or somewhere else like last on the list so like by the time we get to my place or you know it's just like keyboard overdubs or a little guitar overdub maybe a couple background vocals which i can do in like i've got like a big old closet here full of you know bedding and just rough and tumble sort of stuff Mm -hmm. um and uh and that way i sort of like keep it to a minimum but um most for the most part it's like mixing and and doing electronic direct in kind of overdubs and and that type of creative process um all i i I have a duffel bag in the garage with like 30 stands (laughs) and all the all this other stuff that like you know would be super handy and when i go Recording at other studios, I, I tend to pack myself a little uh, a, a little uh, play kit of microphones and stuff. So I still use these things. It's just sort of like it's just funny that I like I still have all this stuff with me. <laughs> I like the idea of a duffel bag full of mic stands. That's actually that as I picture it, that's kind of a the perfect, especially if it's like one of those heavy canvas ones. That's tough. It's like the perfect carrier for all that stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's literally my. My or my brother's old hockey bag from like the late eighties, early nineties. It's just it survived like forty years. <laughs> it's pretty great. Vintage, exactly. vintage duffel bag. It's, it's key. It sounds great. <laughs> it's hard to find those. It's like the era that where we could walk into any um, thrift store or La Salvation Army, and in the corner would just be this incredible collection of old fifties and sixties suitcases that were like 50 cents or a dollar piece oh yeah (laughs) now good luck you know they'll be 
a hundred dollars at some vintage store. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember seeing a lot of bands. That's how they carried a lot of their pedals. It was just these these cool vintage luggage that they bought. For, yeah, and like that was like a thing that I that was common with a lot of bands. I remember seeing and like it's like oh yeah, that's like a nineteen sixties vinyl sky blue hard case uh, luggage. <laughs> it's just yeah, exactly. You probably sell it in Japan for three hundred dollars or something right now. <laughs> um so you know you've got the the Sony MXP3000 and that is the one for which you have designed your own um mic pre's as well the um LC1 yeah. is the MX pre yeah that's uh that's kind of why I bought the board is cuz those are you know the EQ modules and the mic preamp modules you can mix and match and customize it I since talking to you last I got like a a couple of API EQs that API made for this board. It's basically like the 550. Oh my gosh, I can't remember. I, it's weird that I'm not remembering. It's the four band EQ that they sold. Right. Is, for the, like, is that the um, 550A or B or 60? Yeah, something. It's. I should know. I should know. I, too, all, I, right? like, I feel like I'm pulling my pants down here, but it's a, it's. It's the uh, the one they. That's a, you know what that is. That's that's the, it's because our chi- children st- is when we become parents, our children steal our memory. Yeah, exactly. I could ask my <laughs> son; he probably remember. But uh, he, uh, he, no, it's the five fifty B is a four four band EQ. Yeah, it's that it's that one, and it's and I've been looking for that. That's the one. I mean, they will sell you those still for this console, but I think you have to buy like twenty of them. I I ask them every five or ten years when someone's asking me about the board and like, well, can I still buy these modules? I'm like, oh, let me check. And I'll send an email to API and whoever's currently in charge of answering dumb emails from me, <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll ask other people. And I'm sure someone will groan over there and it's like, ah, uh, uh, yeah, I guess we'll sell them if it's like that. And they're ex- uber expensive. It's like something like $1,800 or $2,000 of um, an EQ. So like no one ever buys them. <laughs> uh, um, is the, um, are those... The, are you talking about 500 module? No, it's a, as far as it's, the size. The size is narrower and longer than a 500 module. It's uh, comparable to if you're familiar with the API legacy boards. Um, mm-hmm. They're basically the same modules that fit in those boards, which are okay. narrower and longer. And the 200 module, which is that little little guy that was built for the legacy consoles, that is sort of the same size as the preamp module on the Sony MXP. So I wonder... If That's what I was wondering. That's what it, lo- it looked like. It was that sort of miniature compact size. Yeah, it just has a different type of connector on the back end. And um, I think on the API version, they have balanced outputs on those modules. And on the Sony version, it's unbalanced. Um, but yeah, it's. I wonder if they sort of thought that this would be a standard like they got together and they're like let's make this a sort of a standard for console module <laughs> i don't know whatever but uh that they were the definitely designed with each other in mind i guess Otherwise, yeah well i imagine st- sizes and shapes and, and things like that that become standards in audio like if we dig in we, we discover it's like oh well these are all based on things that were available because of the component parts of the size of edge cards that will connect into other things. Yeah. Um, is that true? Like a lot of times the supplies that you use determine the design of the final, final product, right? Sometimes. Yeah. For console channel width, I think there's like an ex, like, I feel like, um, there's a minimum that people are just comfortable with. Like just, a, you know, having a, having things way too narrow, it's just generally ergonomically uncomfortable. And I think, um, I can't remember what, how wide uh, some of these channels widths are, but like it's, it, there's a, people have kind of settled on a, like a size that uh, is generally accepted or, or expected anyways. And I think you can, you can conform to that, but there are some things like inductors. So like when people are going back and trying to make like Neve modules or clone Neve modules, they're finding out that they need more tight and you know the inductors are fat and the transformers are fat and so they have to sort of like get wide again mm-hmm. and uh and those are really the things that you know force you to have a wider you know channel strip like i i haven't I've, it's been a while since i saw the new the new neve 
uh, Rupert Neve designs consoles, but I'm, I'm assuming those channel strips are channel strips are wider, just because everything's fatter, generally physically fatter. And it has- yeah. Well, I mean, some stuff is just hard to get in there with your fingers too, and use use the stuff. Yeah. Um, like, uh, not to knock like Tone Lux or anything like that, but I remember recording a, a record on a Tone Lux console. And everything was just so tight and my fat fingers were knocking all the knobs. And <laughs> it's like, oh, it's a, this is like a genius board, but except for the fact that you have to be a child to use it because my fingers are too big or whatever. Yeah, I remember um, when I interned at Woodland, you know, they had the Neve 8068 there and I was just amazed at how like all the knobs were just big. Mm-hmm. And chunky. Really easy to grab a big chunky knob. and Yeah, you can just. It's just, it's easy and it's easy to read and easy to see. It's it's great. Uh, yeah, this is like and everything. It felt like a Fisher Price, you know, knob. Yeah, on a toy. <laughs> I'm sure that it's great. Yeah, that's probably like a good. That's a good connection there. It's kind of like the military now. Like uh, I, I saw some YouTube video of someone taking a tour of a submarine, and like the some the Navy commander of the submarine submarine was talking about the old way that the the pilot would steer the submarine. I don't, I'm calling them pilot. I don't know what they're called, but and it involved lots of levers and buttons and pedals and all this sort of stuff. And and now they just use like a game controller. And and <laughs> so it's just like a smooth transition from like gaming into the Navy and to piloting a like multi-billion dollar nuclear submarine. And uh, I was, I figured you'd say it looked like the, the, um, all the, uh, displays and graphics and buttons in a, a McDonald's kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. And like, you know, I kind of like, uh, what happens if the, you know, like the batteries run out in, a, <laughs> in like a very tight situation and like, you know, they all of a sudden have to use these controls that they haven't been training on for their whole career. I don't know. I feel like, uh, there's a catering going on. There's a catering to like get people to do things the way they did them as children to get them sort of comfortable and like out. sometimes it's good to be like taught a new thing and thrown out of your element but maybe not in the sense where you're using a knob that's like too small to move <laughs> yeah that's an interesting topic the idea of designing things to feel familiar <laughs> to us as kids i mean you know the studio and music the more we get to that the happier we are because we're just trying to have fun in the studio anyway yeah just getting the lighting and everything like it's funny when you go to some studios where the the vibe, the vibe, uh, the vibe is really leaned on heavily, and you're just like, I'm kind of in a playroom. <clears throat> like it looks like a like a playroom for a child, but I'm the child, and the toys are a lot bigger, and it's great. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's perfect. Like everywhere I look, there's something cool and exciting to see, and you know, I want to play with that thing. It's like whether it's a there's a cool weird keyboard from like you know the 70s that didn't last past one you know round of making it and there'll be other weird sounding instruments just laying around i mean a good studio has like a good balance of that sort of stuff you don't want to like fill up the room full of garbage that just gets in the way of doing what the band wants to do but you also want to have access to things to make cool sounds that you weren't planning on making too yeah so what you just described i feel like that's the inevitable too like if it's a, a studio tends towards entropy, right? So, like in like in um, chemistry, like in physics, yeah, the concept that things go, you know, lean towards naturally towards chaos. So, what do you what do you do about that in the studio? Do you feel like it's just you just have to have a regular process of going in and and saying like, well, all right, we just don't need this anymore? I I found that I'm that voice at electrical. And it, mm-hmm. I kind of like, I'm guarded when I have those impulses thinking like, I'm just turning into like an old man who's like complaining about stuff being in the way and like just clutter and stuff. And we, you know, electrical has been there at the, I want to say new location. It's not new at all. <laughs> it's been there since 96, 97. Yeah. It's been there for a long time and we've collected lots and lots and lots of things over the years. Um, just like, you know, any anybody who runs a studio, you always have a friend that's like leaving town, getting a new job, doing this or that, and they leave a, a some some second tier instrument that they barely used at your place and say, Yeah, you know, you can have it, use it, you know, you probably make more use of it. Right. That kind of thing. If yeah. you guys are able to fix this, you know, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> 
So you end up, <laughs> you just end up with like wall to wall, um, sort of like single use toys. Uh, like, you know, I had a, I had a keyboard at my old studio, my old house. I did this to the current owner of my old house where I had my old studio. Um, there was a keyboard that might've been in a church basement called the fun maker. And mm-hmm. that, that's a kind of thing that just, you know, the left hand, you had like a matrix of buttons that were just chords. <laughs> you just hit the button and be like a C sharp, you know, it'd be like a B. Yeah. And then you have the regular keyboard, which you had, you know, you could select 10 different sounds for and all of them crazy and cool sounding. And it had its own little amplifier that sounded broken up and cool. But, uh, you know, it was, it was one of those overdub makers, you know, at the end of a night kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's just like, we got to find some use for this and it sounds crazy. It's a cool thing to have, but it's also the size of a console piano, basically, basically like taking up that much space. And, uh, and you know, so now Chris Witt, the owner of my house, has that and a couple other things that, that I trimmed off that fat. But at Electrical, I, I am that person walking around the rooms and seeing there's like no, you know, I, I have like a, uh, when there's a lot of clutter, I get like, kind of antsy and dizzy and dizzy at the same time <laughs> and i just mm-hmm. have you know nooks where i can place guitar amps and nice clean area for drums and, you know and i when i walk through the, we have a lot of guitars and we have a lot of keyboards and pianos and you know our guitars will take up a lot of guitar stands and like first thing i do is just like okay find a new place for you know these awesome guitars which i i'm kind of rolling my eyes at like i have no I literally have no appreciation for fancy guitars. Like I, I have no, I should give no shits about vintage, you know, wealthy, fancy, you know, collecting, you know, collector's item guitars. And mm-hmm. we have a bunch, we had, you know, just a bunch of nice, cool guitars. But when I walk in and I don't see that, I just see like, it's in my way. <laughs> it's like, I see like the band's going to come in want to put their guitar somewhere. And they're like, right, exactly. We have our, you know, array of show show guitars, which I call them that. They're not really, they're, that's just where they are. We have to put them somewhere. But it looks like we're trying to show off, like, look at this guitar that's, you know, kind of useful for one little sound. And <laughs> look at this other guitar. And like, we have oddball guitars that aren't like universally, you know, useful, but like, they're just cool. And Yeah, I got a bunch of stuff like that too. It's the process also, I think of, of, accumulating your studio gear in the early stages when you don't have much spending money. And so you're like, you keep picking up $200 items, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, and then one day you're like, Oh shit, I got to like, this just a giant pile of two, you know, stuff that's like pretty cool, but not necessarily great all the time. Yeah. That's- and then later I'm like, you know what? I just want my next guitar. I want a, just a guitar. That's just really one really good guitar. <laughs> and then you end up missing some of the other one. Yeah, the yeah. So I, I am that person, and like uh, I'll work at a the Wilco loft occasionally, where Wilco has right on stuff, and that's where they record everything. And Jeff Tweedy and Tom Chnick like record their stuff, and uh, the uh, and that's like the epitome of gear, amps, and pedals everywhere for like rock band kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Like you, you can't walk like two steps without trying to avoid stepping on or bumping into or brushing up against like some amazing piece of gear and, and also some just, you know, cool, cheap gear. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the, and, uh, Mark Greenberg, who sort of like runs the place. He, he, uh, he, uh, like does an amazing job keeping it organized and, and keeping it like a, in a way that makes sense to all of them, which I, I don't think I could do. I think I'd just be like, like crushed by the mountain of <laughs> like organizing that you'd have to deal with in that scenario. But so it's not that crazy, but, but there is like a, there is like that tantalizing sort of like, Oh, what if it, what if I tried that guitar up there? I've never even seen that guitar. Oh, what about that guitar? And then you just sort of spend two hours just playing around. It's like, we still, yeah. we still got to record something here. <laughs> it's like, you know, the first three. So if you bring a band in there, you're just like, guys, don't bring any instruments. Like everything's already there. Or like put a towel, put like a curtain in front of all the, the 
options and bring the working stuff you have that you like and that you've written you know like yeah if it, if it's, it depends on the thing like the, if it's a session where you have two days to do a lot of work you don't want to be dicking around with all that stuff but if it's like yeah you know people who want to do that then there's no reason not to do that and, you know go crazy that's what you're doing it for <laughs> hey rock stars yeah you i've got a secret to tell you Want to know how I get a consistent sound mixing over a thousand hours of recording studio rock stars? Well, my secret is using Isotope, RX, Ozone, Neutron, Voice Enhancement Assistant, and Nectar to make every episode of this podcast sound great. Right now, you're hearing RX Breath Control, D-Click, D-Clip, DS, Deplosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, Neutron EQ, VEA, and Limiting, all from Isotope. Use the secret code ROCK10 to get 10% off or pick up the new Trash Light along with many of the other free cool plugins over at isotope.com. Yeah, there's times where I just tell an artist, you know, in the preamble time or whatever, just go up there and just go plug into stuff and try things out and see what you think. You know, we're not recording. We're not recording your part yet. So, so go try some things and see if you like it. But, um, you know, it's easy to overdo that too. I've, I've definitely, I mean, I've done sessions where we're like, all right, we're going to listen to every guitar and every amp combo for this next overdub. And it was, fine for me to go through that process at one point uh, in my learning you know path and then you and then afterwards you're like well that turned out pretty cool but so did this where we didn't do all of that stuff we just we just played a really good part on a guitar that's good enough it's sort of like um it's sort of like the many takes issue it's like if they're, you know, we're like well I don't know well, let's keep listening because maybe one of the other ones is better than this and then you realize at a certain point, you're like, okay, well, if we've got something and it's already good, it's good enough, then nobody's there. If we just stop auditioning things, nobody's ever going to hear the other versions. So in a way, it doesn't matter. It's like the tree that falls in the woods. If nobody's there there to listen to it, did it actually fall? Yeah. No, I think we we might have talked about this before, but yeah, you and I both have worked on like records and obviously this was more common in it, beforehand but like just with budgets that had you know enough time for people to spend three days getting getting a sound or you know and i you know i just sort of glaze over after certain points like you know um you know it turns into that psychological sort of scenario it's like okay it's more of a matter of like when this person's blood sugar and happy like when when he feels like ready to do the part and not not as much about like finding the perfect sound because these are all variations of like good sounds for this thing that you're trying to do, and they'll, they'll all be fine. <laughs> like Eric, you know, yeah, most of them will be fine, um, and it's informative. But like, uh, it's that sort of like tapping into that other side of the job that you don't, you know, you remember in those moments. Like, oh yeah, there's a there's a there's a momentum aspect that you know. Has, like there has to be a happiness point that they must reach before they feel good about even playing the thing. And <laughs> and that's just sort of like sitting there and being patient and letting them do what they need to do. And yeah, and I think it's good for us to remember too, that in the end, when somebody listens, they're just going to decide very quickly. They either like the singer or they don't like the singer. Yeah. And in, exactly. in that respect, nothing else matters. <laughs> there's that, I forget where I heard this, but like there's that, process of decision making making choices and the example of like trying to pick a movie to watch on netflix was given and you know how people will waste like a half an hour just flipping through like trying to choose what to watch and um it, the idea was you have a limit of 10 things 10 options so the first 10 options that come across the, you know like the table uh, you stop right there, even though there's like hundreds more, you stop after 10 and just pick the best one out of those 10 and, and be satisfied with, you know, that that's going to be good. You're going to pick a good thing and, and have that be the trade off versus spending half a day trying to like hunt through the hundreds of other stuff and under, other options and coming up with something that will probably be marginally different than the, the thing that you, the best of the first 10. 
And I love it, dude. It's 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 the great creative reset. You'll you'll have no choices for what you want to enjoy, and you'll like it. Yeah, <laughs> the, it does make me re reappreciate. I did a tape recording seminar in in Winnipeg at a cool studio up in Winnipeg that I helped install consoles in called No Fun. It's a really cool place, uh, and then literally really cool because it's freezing up there in the winter time. But like. Um, I do these tape seminars once in a while where I'd sort of show oh, cool. show people like, you know, how the the process of recording on the tape, at, you know, in a session and also just the technology and like, you know, how tape records, you know, sound and like and the physicality of it all and and also just the limitations and the sonic differences of the speeds and the and the levels on tape and and we did like a little seminar up there. Steve Albini and I've done this at, at a bunch of times at different, you know, different places around the world. Like, or just we went to a mix with the masters. Steve did a mix with the masters seminar like six or seven times, and I, I went out with them each time and did like a day where I would do a tape machine talk and set up and all that stuff. But anyways, we did one. That's great. In Winnipeg last uh, summer, and uh, you know, you set up a band and you record a song and you do overdubs and you mix down. And there's like, you know, 10 people there to watch and ask questions the entire time. And and just reiterating the shit or get off the pot kind of aspect of recording the tape where like, you know, you're not making a million takes and then comping them. You're sort of like listening back and keeping in mind like, okay, here, this is what it is. Listen back. This is what's going to be on the record. Do you like it or not? Like just a, a yes, no kind of like proposition each, each overdub each step along the way, like, this is how it is. There isn't really like, you know, if you don't like it, let's redo it. Let's do it again. But, but there's nothing, you're not kicking the can down the road at all. It's, you have to decide whether you like this or not. And, you know, keep that presence, that mentality of, of constantly sort of like, you got to keep an awareness of what you're doing as being pivotal and, and consequent, consequential. Uh, you can't sort of just, well, you know, we'll just we'll just come back and you know edit that and make it sound better. Or we'll 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 come back and pick which best of these thirty guitar solos and you know complement. It's 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 just enlightening to sort of do that and be excited that at the end of the day you're you recorded the song and the song's done for the most part. I mean, you can always go back and redo it, but uh, just the process of like whatever you're doing is the thing that will be the finished item and that's kind of a fun aspect yeah i think for me the learning stage was doing um tracking with my band and especially because we did some live to two track where you can't go through and mess with individual bits oh, definitely. and so it i find that's really valuable because it trains you to focus on the the overall gist of the th take that you're listening to like it, which one it just feels like it has a better energy altogether, which one is more engaging. And then in, in the tracking multi-track stage, I feel like I carry that over on a certain level because there's, you just, it's nice to listen and just be like, just which one feels better and go with that. And then, um, and then, you know, let go of small mistakes because small mistakes can be pretty easily fixed. You could be like, yeah, I can, I can edit that one little guitar chord that, had a clam yeah but the overall feel and vibe and uh, of the song and or the take you know yeah it's the important thing i think yeah, yeah a lot of times the bands i record like seem to be coming in a little bit more now now with the assumption that everything's going to be done discreetly and i remember that that was a that wasn't like there's a it's gone in waves like and then it seems like the early 2000s bands were like i'm coming in i'm gonna play live we're all gonna play live try to get everything done live and then like it you know goes back to sort of i'm gonna make this creation from the ground up starting with a click track and we're all doing our things and you know it it always like goes back and forth at least my experience yeah and, and now like uh i feel like there is a more of a mechanical sort of aspect to some some normal rock music that i'm coming across like where there's always a click or a guide track and an assumption because they may have done this in their practice space or something and you know they re recorded their own own uh 
they recorded their last records themselves. And this is kind of like how they muddled through it. And they kind of got in a comfort zone doing that. And, uh, I, you know, I, I still, I still try to like get everybody set up to play live and sort of like, you know, if, if that's, that's what they want to do, I sort of say like, okay, yeah, we'll be focusing on the drums, but like everybody should be playing together and hearing each other and, and, you know, working off that and, and act through actual loud amplifiers to like, you know, I, and a lot of times people are used to, you know, virtual amplifiers and going direct in and then, or, you know, do it, recording a direct track and then picking their amplifier, like, you know, weeks later when they try to mix or something, <laughs> you know, the, it, it, it's a, you know, it's a weird sort of, in my mind, it's a weird sort of uh, plan of attack. I, I feel like, you play differently if you hear your instrument in the room with you and you play differently if you hear your band playing with you. And there's no reason to reinvent that, that world. Uh, if you're comfortable playing as a band together in your practice space, like you, you should, you should, you should try to capture that. I feel like even if you're trying to do all sorts of fun, crazy stuff in a studio, but I feel like the the core rhythm section, the band, feels best when it's a band that is naturally playing together and you know and they're used to playing with each other not they're not like assembled on this in the studio if it's a band that is used to playing together it's i feel like that's the best way to get them down and so most of the time, yeah most of the time when they set up and play live even though they don't they're like okay this is just for the drums you know half the time everything else is keeper takes too because they just end up getting in this in the zone and playing as a band and yeah, well, it's it's um, there's stuff that happens. Like you play your guitar differently when you're playing along with the band than you do when you're overdubbing at times. And sometimes it's sometimes these are good things to discover. To discover, like sometimes you get to the overdub and you're like, oh, I can be, I can play this far more carefully, or you know, and that could be a good thing. Or you know, you can add precision where you were sloppy. Yeah. But other times. It's you know it can be the reverse. It could be like the the natural kind of thing you did had the right energy and just you know gelled with the band and it's missing when you try and make it perfect as an overdub. Yeah, like like just my main thing is like rhythm, or, you know, just like timing and rhythm. Like even when people squonk a note and trip up and you kind of you kind of hear them giddy up to get to the downbeat, that almost turns into a cool thing that you wouldn't have gotten um, if you're sitting there like on a chair, like hovering over like your pedal board in the control room, like meticulously hitting every note, like, you know, just right. Like I, it's kind of, it's the, you know, it's the stuff that you like when you listen to a live recording where it's like, there's like a clam, but the clam sort of like, you know, hits a drone note that's kind of weird and but cool sounding. And you never would have planned to do that. And you never would have, allowed that to be on the record if you're sitting there punching in your your guitar like it'd be the type of thing that in the room you'd be like oh that sounds cool but let me go ahead and just like fix that real quick because i don't know if i want that no matter what style of music you make native instruments gives your studio all the instruments you need from drums, loops, and beats, to the coolest synthesizers, realistic strings, guitar amps, and futuristic synth pads. I love to record real bands in my studio, but then I mix it up with cool sounds from Contact, Massive X, Super 8, Battery, Guitar Rig, and Hybrid Keys, for example, to make my music way more exciting and interesting. Use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off, or download the free gifts waiting for you, like the awesome new Jacob Collier your audience choir or complete start featuring 2000 sounds and six gigs of free samples at nativeinstruments.com. Yeah. And then there's also the thing about, I mean, bad clams are, you know, we can usually identify as bad, but there's the unexpected characteristics of the way you played it those kind of clams like you're describing. And those things can actually, I think we need to remember to listen for like, all right, we, I did the thing that I didn't expect I was going to do. I played it different that time. But listen for how I recovered to get back into the, the groove with the band. And sometimes that's what's so interesting, you know, that it, you realize that like it's the, our recovery from something can actually be 
a quality that makes a song and a recording really interesting. Yeah, it's that it's that excitement. You know, like if if they're like you know, if they're totally you know, like zoned out and and into it, and yeah, it's I I kind of liken it to a singer, you know, cracking their voice cracking when they're hitting like a a hard note or like a hard moment in a song and like you can hear the excitement and how hard it is and and it sort of elevates that moment in the song and like sure you could go back and hit you know punch it in and hit that note cleanly but like i feel like it doesn't translate it doesn't like transmit that excitement as well as just hearing the person be excited and their voice crack <laughs> as long as it's not yeah and bad you know yeah, totally. And and um, I think about this, or I sort of realize this in the world of tuning vocals, which I'm going to assume is something that you probably gratefully just stay away from entirely. <laughs> I don't. But maybe you do go there sometimes. I don't know. I don't. I don't mind it so much uh, when things are just distractingly out of tune. I, I I'll definitely do that. But I, yeah, I don't do it as like a. All right, now let's put it through this and clean everything up. And yeah, it's like. Uh, I try to, I do try to avoid it and I've, I've kind of kept it hard for me to do it. Like, um, I don't have, um, a tool that's like at the ready. It, it's, it's funny, like how technology influences this. When I was working in digital mm -hmm. performer, digital performer had the tuning tool within the track. Like you can just toggle down to like just a Melodyne looking sort of tool within the track and like doing it was uber easy you didn't have to sort of load it into melodyne that's kind of how the new pro tools is where it's just built baked into the track it's not baked into the track it's like there it is baked in the new pro tools where it's baked into the track um so if someone's singing it usually would be like a you know a not like a bass note if the bass intonation was off and that'd be like the most extreme is i would go through and just like clean that up because it would just be so sour sounding and there's nothing you can really do about it except for re-record it on a new, you know, a new bass track. But if it's in a scenario, we can't really do that as easily as just tweaking the one weird intonated note. Then mm -hmm. uh, For the bass guitar. Yeah, for the bass. Just like get it, get it in there. And then all of a sudden it sounds great. And there's no, there's not that like irritating distraction. But, mm -hmm. you know, obviously there are songs where like things are out of tune. Sounds great too. But like, the vocal stuff, like, I definitely don't, I definitely don't go whole hog on it. Like, I, I don't work with a lot of musicians that are really rigid about that sort of stuff. And Greg, I think the kids now say go ham on it. Go ham on it? Okay. I, yeah, I don't go ham or bologna or anything, like turkey. <laughs> you go turkey on it, actually. <laughs> don't go turkey on it. I do do, like, a, I like using the, so yeah, the digital performer made it like so I could just do it and play it to them and s tell them like, hey, does this sound better? And they're like, yes or no, and they they either say yes or no, and it's done. But like yeah. with the, you know, like up until recently, the version of Pro Tools that I was using, like I had like, okay, give me a minute, I got to load it into Melodyne, and then that's gonna be like, you know, <laughs> the whole thing, and then you're you're making everybody feel weird in the room. It's like, ah, eh, this is embarrassing. I couldn't hit the note, and like you know, they're they're thinking about it, and then it's you know, I'm sure there's like a lightning fast way to do it without forcing everybody to suffer, but I just didn't get there. But so that process would be a whole different animal. And so it would sort of like deter me from even attempting to do it, but the digital performer do it within a second and playing it back to them. That was like easier to get, you know, easier to do. And I would do it more often on just little things like, you know, if someone's been suffering doing a bunch of takes and there's a great take, but this one little thing is a little off and their voice is rust, like roasted. And, you know, just be like, okay, let me just nudge that one note up and, we're all done. <laughs> and as long, yeah. as long as it sounds like a normal human being, it should, should work. I mean, well, I think that um, you're also reminding us of sometimes the effort. There's like the sunk cost of effort. Like, so because we took the time to load it out and put it into a tuning app, maybe it's Melodyne and, and work on it and then decide, you know, listen to it and say, like, is this better or worse? We might be more likely to go with the tuned thing just because it took that much effort to do it. Whereas when you can do things really quick and in the moment in the studio, you can make quick decisions um, 
which can be helpful, you know. And I like the quickness of demoing an idea. So like, uh, you know, I usually like we'll have like weird little harmony ideas that are easier to show than it is to describe for me. Like, you know, there'll be a situation where I'll take like a a vocal take or vocal track and then duplicate it and play another take of that vocal track. Uh, so it's like a doubled vocal kind of thing. And then I can just quickly pitch shift, you know, that that double to do the demonstration of the harmony thing that I'm thinking of. And it's just, that that's just super handy as a tool, you know, just to work as a demonstration. And there's no like, because I can't sing, so I can't just like, let me, here, why don't you try doing this and then play the song and then I'll sing the harmony over the song. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to like hear them sing the harmony before, you know, like just to see if they like hear them with the pitch shifted version of them singing the harmony. Yeah. And like, see if that sounds cool and if it's worth doing. And if it is, then we'll do it or we'll just leave it like that. And if it isn't, then we didn't waste any time. So just rewinding to the idea of like making things perfect. Um, what I noticed when getting into and learning how to tune vocals was that a, a, a very tuned vocal, uh, I began to notice that it can actually remove the energy and excitement and interest from a track um, in a way that makes a lot of sense to me. In other words, it's easy to just be like, oh, it's too perfect. It's not cool. But then, but then you're like, well, what does that really mean? And I, and, and I think what I realized is that when you hear somebody singing and they're, and it's a hard note and they're trying to get to the note, <laughs> you hear the human effort of trying to get to the note. And that's part of what makes it interesting. And if, and if it's too well tuned, it actually makes the, the voice sound like, oh, it was kind of easy. So therefore it wasn't even, so like, why are we even paying attention? It wasn't that hard to do. And and rewinding that to what you said about the overdub process, I think that probably applies to the band and the music and all the instruments too. It's like if it's when things are so carefully put together and perfect, maybe they just don't sound like anybody really had to do any work to get there. And so is it even interesting? Yeah, I've noticed that with a lot of um, like... I'll get like um, references for newer bands that are very, very mathy and intricate. Like, uh, you know, it'll be like a rock band setup, but everything, you know, just really complicated sort of mathy music. And and I'll listen to it, and there just the kind of the there will be I can hear auto tuning just of the instruments, and then I'll hear like this sort of this hyper compression that I I don't know if it. I, I just associate with like some plugins that are really good at what they're designed to do, where they just like mm -hmm. transparently compress things to the point where you can't hear that thrashing effect, but it but it does make every note sort of like have the same intensity, and you know there's 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 a lot of consistency there, and it and the virtuosity is kind of lost, and it sounds kind of like a like sort of like a MIDI synthesized sort of arrangement. And, right. And, uh, but I can tell it's a real person playing guitar because, you know, there'll be like a live version of the song and the guy's playing or the person's playing the guitar. And, and, and by definition, it's a pretty fucking hard guitar part, but now it doesn't sound all that hard because it's, every, it sounds so effortlessly done. So fluid and every note has the same presence. There's no like, there's no dead, dead hits. There's no drones. There, there's nothing out of the ordinary and it does remind me of like um like late 90s or mid 90s sci-fi midi compositions that would be on like star trek the next generation or like or some you know right. some tv show where it's just like a midi arrangement and it's like oh they, yeah we're not even versus the original star trek soundtrack <laughs> which was really somebody trying to play the fucking um uh um the <laughs> yes, the theremin. Thank you. I was just blanking on the word. And just like singing that, like just that screechy, like insanity that, you know, yeah, they were yeah. Like, exactly. And talk about a hard instrument to play, the theremin. Yeah. And that's funny too, because that's kind of what your voice is. And it's, it's amazing that people can pitch their voices as I'm talking monotone. It's amazing that people can pitch their voices so as well as they can. Because uh, if you tried using some other part of your body to do that, like you kind of see how hard that is. Like it, it's kind of funny. Like 
you can't make your hand, which you think you have total control over, you can't make your hand be perfect, precise pitch easily. Whereas like if, for most people, they can hear and sort of imitate a pitch with their voice. Hmm. I don't know. Obviously, it's human beings have been doing it for several hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> human beings Whatever that. we've been doing this for several hundred years we just uh, we've only been recently recording it though <laughs> ancient greeks so it was like that was like 180 years ago ancient greece i don't remember i don't, know. <laughs> I don't like math <laughs> In 2024, Atom Audio will celebrate 25 years of researching, developing, and manufacturing industry-leading monitoring solutions in Berlin. To mark this milestone, our friends at Atom Audio are unveiling a very special limited edition series of monitors that will look gorgeous in your studio and sound as awesome as your music. Introducing the Arctic White A4V and A7V series, available for a limited time to pro and home studio owners like yourself. The clean, glossy white finish exudes a decadent feel and will stand out in any studio or in-home audio system. Featuring the XART accelerated ribbon tweeter design and customizable speaker voicings, the Arctic White A4V and A7V have the full specifications of the original design. Plus, with Sonarworks integration for automated room correction, you can fine-tune your monitors to your control room's acoustics. Plus, with Sonarworks in Integration for automated room correction, you can fine tune your monitors to your control room's acoustics. Adam Audio's commitment to delivering professional grade, high fidelity sound to studios worldwide has made these monitors a perfect fit for Grammy winning producers in both pro and home studios for a quarter of a century. Now you can bring that beautiful high fidelity sound to your own productions and make your studio look as amazing as your music. Don't miss out on the new limited edition Arctic White A. A4V and A7V monitors available for a short time with an extended five year warranty at adamaudio.com. I am super impressed with Isotope Ozone. I've been mastering many of my records recently, and Ozone makes it so easy to get a fantastic sound. The built-in mastering assistant helps by measuring the mix and suggesting all the settings needed for a professionally mastered result based on the genre and EQ curve of your choice. You can even reference a specific song if you want. Using simple yet sophisticated modules like Clarity, Impact, Low End Focus, Stabilizer, Imager, Exciter, and Spectral Shaping, along with powerful dynamic EQ, compression, and limiting, you simply adjust Adjust the settings to your own taste and it sounds incredible. And the magic of master rebalance means that you can reach into your mix at the mastering stage and manipulate the vocal, bass, and drums. Amazing! My bandmates are pretty demanding of my mixes, but now when I send off the masters for approval, the band absolutely loves the way our records sound thanks to Isotope and Ozone. Use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off Ozone or other tools like like RX and Voice Enhancement Assistant, or grab any of the cool free plugins like the new Trash Light over at isotope.com. Hey, Rockstars, welcome back. We're here for the jam session. My guest today is Greg Norman joining us from his studio, Normaphone, I think, up in Chicago. Greg, you ready to jam? Sure. I've got the <laughs> the uh, crappy name of Studio Greg Studios, um, which I thought was... Studio Greg Studios? Yeah, I did that on purpose. So I, I remember how I would, I would read all these like crazy studio names and I'd be like, I'm not going to be the person that has like Excelsior Studios or Nimrad or, you know, like that, whatever. So I thought, yeah. thought of the dumbest name I could think of and it sort of stuck. Which one? Normaphone? Uh, Studio Greg Studios. Studio Greg Studios. So... um but so let me let me ask this: What is a normophone other than a single bell saxophone? That thing is awesome. A normophone is actually like a brass instrument, a valved brass instrument that's shaped like a saxophone. And I still want one. I haven't I haven't been able to buy one, but they're out there somewhere. Um, is it about as hard to play as a theremin? I bet because the leverage is all off. If you play like a trumpet or a trombone, you're like you're sort of pressing against your lips, you know, in a linear way. And this thing, you're sort of like holding it like a saxophone and sort of like 
you know, wedging it against your, I don't know. I don't, I've never tried it. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm excited for the moment when I'm like 73 years old and I can start smoking cigarettes and doing heroin and things. <laughs> no, do whatever you want. Yeah, no responsibilities. I'll be in a home. They'll, everybody else around me will be playing video games because that's our generation. When we retire, they'll just be playing video games probably. You can, at that point, you can order the butt phone, which hasn't been invented yet. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to hold my breath for that one. But <laughs> but I feel like there'll be a time when I'm 70 and I've just I've just like I've just started my heroin injection started my lighting a pack of cigarettes which costs like $80 a piece or something like that or a cigarette. Will you actually use a a, a lit pack of cigarettes to light the other pack of cigarettes? Oh yeah, the with the plastic included. And you lit that with a $100 bill rolled up. Yeah, exactly. And uh and then I'll just say out loud like Where's my Norma phone? Or can I have a Norma phone? And then some somehow a machine will give me a Norma phone right away. And I'll have then and I'll play it for like five minutes and get really mad and throw it in the corner and it'll be on a pile of other Norma phones, like in the corner. <laughs> I like that. Um, so I, I think Norma phone was the name attached on your website also to your um LC one. Is that right? Or yeah. How am I interpreting this? Norma phone is basically the name for all my I have like an LLC. And that's the name of like my my LLC. Whenever I make a, a, a piece of equipment, like preamp or EQ or whatever, I just I just brand it Norma Phone. And uh, okay, groovy. So that's that's sort of what that is. So now the LC one, as we we were discussing it earlier, that's your mic pre that's available still. And you and you have other things available. And and do you sell the LC one as just a you know, a, a circuit board that needs to be inserted into a console, or do you do one that includes the preamp? I mean, excuse me, the power supply, and we could just it's plug and play ready for a studio. So that one, that one is specifically for the Sony board. And then what I did was bring that preamp design to Electrical Audio, and we sort of partnered up, in quote air quotes, um, to make the Electrical Audio EA. Pre-Q, which is basically a two-channel rack-mounted preamp. That's my preamp with an equal little basic shelf boost EQ, a low a fr- low frequency and a high frequency shelf boost EQ. And uh, that we have, we start. I started that sometime 2012 or 13, and and we would sell it out of the studio. And now uh, this year, um, I finally got. Uh, started on the 500 series version of both those preamps, like my preamp uh, and the Studio Electricals preamp, which are the preamp section is identical, but the EQ makes the electrical audio version different. And uh, my friend Shane Hostetler in Milwaukee, who runs a studio called Howell Street, is a great uh, uh, recordist, engineer, and also a great drummer. Is in a band called, or I recorded in a band called Call Me Lightning. Uh, several years ago he's got a great studio and he he was ditching his console and he had like a sony mxp 3000 console with a bunch of my preamps in it and he's like i'm doing everything in the box i don't need this board i'm just going to buy 500 racks and go straight into the computer from there so can you build me 16 preamps that'll fit in a 500 module and and then that that finally lit, lit a fire under my butt to design the 500 module version of my preamp and so i made finally i'm making like 500 modules and i haven't like sort of put it on my website or we haven't tried selling it yet i've done you know 20 sort of i guess you would call like the first run of 20 and ironed out all the process and i did we did 10 for the studios version and probably sometime next year we'll be full on trying to sell them i like all the stuff the stuff that's not fun, like uh, making a little uh, like steel sled for the preamp to sit in, <laughs> like designing mm-hmm. like the three dimensional drawing for that, you know, coming up with packaging, getting like a you know foam cut to the shape of your thing, and ordering enough of that to make sense, and like just the stuff that has nothing to do with design or even manufacturing. Um, all the all the stuff that just sort of like makes it hard and you realize, you know, this is why companies have several employees. <laughs> it's like, right. And say like, Hey, you know, your job is to 
make it develop a box and packing kit and you over there you you uh i don't know i don't know what these people do I'd, otherwise i'd be doing it <laughs> but uh but these box these box friendly packing kit people yeah exactly and you figure out how you're supposed to you know run a small business and then tell me what i should do <laughs> like yeah, that right but uh yeah so after, that's that's the thing that from the tech manufacturing side I'm kind of excited about that I can actually do now. It's like I've I've figured out how to do it and now it's just a matter of like doing all the boring stuff like taking good photos, you know, getting like a professional ish looking, you know, setup going and, and selling them. But it's the same thing. You're gonna you're gonna end up dedicating a room of your studio to a white tent with very bright lights in it that you can take photos of things in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd, yeah, I, I've always like think like I'm a big fan of outsourcing, and I, I've got like I can think of five or six friends that have that tent and that like you know, that weird slopey white material that's against the wall. I'm like, right. I have a friend that builds amplifiers and sells them, and I have a friend that like the infinity wall. Yeah, how come we don't have a a wall in the studio called an infinity wall? That sounds pretty cool. That'd be cool. That I want an infinity wall for sound. Be like an anechoic chamber in a way. That's true. That's true. All the photo, uh, photography people are like, how come we don't have echo chambers for photography? <laughs> I want to, I want to see everything <laughs> repeated over and over and over again. Um, um can I, all right. Well, uh, ha, uh, can I ask you some questions about your records? So, Rockstars, we have a discography of Greg's work in the show notes. Just scroll down when you're ready and, and listen to some of this stuff. Cause this sounds killer, really, really good sounding records. Um, and one of them, I'll just, I'll just start hitting up a few of these. So make believe of course, um, that, uh, you know, and if I, if I'm getting too specific on anything, you can just kind of answer in general, but great guitar and drum sounds. And so I was curious if you wanted to talk about um, how you might typically set up a band like that for a recording, um, maybe maybe some of the miking details, we can dig more into things like drums and stuff too. Sure. But um, what about just setting up a band? I guess if you're over at Electrical, do you have ways that you set up a band in Studio A versus Studio B? Uh, yes. And that band... Uh it's an incredible band to record. It's uh, these music- musicians, insanely good musicians, and can play play their parts pretty effortlessly. Uh, it seems, at least, it seems like. Um, but those recorded two records of theirs, and both of them were done in Studio A, and they're both done to tape. Um, most of the stuff they did was playing live, um, and uh, and I'd, there'd be two different setups one setup where there's a small live room in studio a and there's a large live room uh the drums would be set up in the small live room and the amp guitar amp would be in the big live room and so you get, and you get like a big room sound for the guitar and this is in studio b this is in studio a, oh. studio a. which one is which maybe oh. maybe start with that remind the rock stars which one is a and which one is b at electrical because they do have really different shapes to them and arrangements yeah studio studio b is is kind of the rough and tumble uh studio it's got two main playing rooms and a little vocal booth but the the big live room is like a a cavernous uh brick wall live room that has 30 foot high ceilings and you know it has a really long reverb decay time and then there's a, a larger dead room right off of that that you could fit a whole band in if you really wanted to um but it's a simpler sort of space and really you know rough like construction style yeah and you run up the stairs to get to the control room which is above the dead room right Correct. yeah the control room sitting above the dead room and overlooking the big live room from the second floor and and what's the what's the console in that room again that is a, a heavily upgraded but not it's like a modified and upgraded neotech series two um which the modifications were a lot more sort of about improving reliability and then adding a sort of a fader flop, uh, flip option so you can kind of record in a more traditional in line fashion. And, you know, it's probably the best set Neotech Series 2 console out there. Um, but uh, it's it's very bare bones kind of 
straight and clean kind of console. And uh, yeah, that's the board in Studio B. And then uh, in Studio A is like the larger, sort of more flexible of the two studios. It's got a lot more square footage, three big, three decent size, you know, playing spaces, one big 30 by 25 foot trapezoid, roughly live room. And that's filled with tons of gear and pianos. So you break up all those sort of any, the liveness is kind of, it's got a long reverb time, but it's a darker kind of reverb because of the, the makeup of the walls. It's a different type of brick. It's made of Adobe brick, which is, right. which is kind of the size of a, you know, uh, I used to say VCR, but people don't really know what those look like anymore. Do they? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like a, it's a toaster. Is it bigger or better? Wait, no, people would always compare things to a bread box. And then everybody's like, wait, what the hell is a bread box? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, a lightly, it, it's the size of half a lightly filled backpack. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a big brick. Big ass bricks. Not as big as a cinder block, as, but big, big bricks. Oh, but thicker. So it'll be um, about 10 inches deep, the wall. Um, and the bricks are irregular in shape and size. So basically the wall is not resonant. Like you could, uh, ah, interesting. a cinder block wall you could hit on one side with a hammer and you'd hear it clear as a bell on the other side. And this, because it's kind of made of mud and irregular size, you just, it just thuds against the wall and it doesn't transmit as yeah. And that was like the basic gist of like, all the rooms are separated with these Adobe brick walls and we were going to leave it exposed and see what it sounded like. And if it didn't, we didn't like the way it sounded, we'd build out in front of it, but we just like. So let me, let me ask you this question. Cause you were involved in this construction too. Uh, and I'll clarify something based on what you just said. So rockstar is when we, when Greg says the bricks are different sizes, I think sometimes the first image we conjure up is, Oh, so it's like a diffused wall surface. And that's not, that's not accurate. It's, it does have the look of a, of a consistent brick wall surface. But, but what you pointed out is great because I'd never considered that before, that the wall, the physical physicality of the wall itself doesn't have a resonance um, because each size of the brick is different and the buildup. And that means that sound doesn't trans, uh, transfer through the wall at a particular resonant frequency, which does happen with a pane of glass, for example. Yeah, and it does happen with... Uh center block and or CMU uh, type bricks. And it's uh, a, yeah. cause they're all made from the same form, which is identical. And so each brick has a similar size and you typically would fill cinder block walls with sand to try to dampen that a little bit. But mm-hmm. You don't really, it doesn't work that great, but. Right. And then um, I guess the next part of my question is if, when you do, a double wall construction with drywall and wood frames, you learn about things like, oh, you better you better get acoustic sealant and caulk every crack and crevice mm-hmm. so that sound doesn't transfer through the small gaps and things like that. Do you have to think like that with the Adobe construction as well? And was there anything specific about making sure there weren't any cracks for sound to get through? Yeah, you want to make sure things are basically watertight in 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 theory um the bricks are so wide and use so much mortar that like it sort of fills in a lot of those gaps uh okay and and like i said just because they're made from mud originally it's kind of if you did take a hammer and whack it with a hammer you'd you'd break a chunk off it's like that porous and that soft like as far so don't do that when you go to electrical rock stars your hammers no hammers allowed exactly or pickaxes uh, but we, but it still, it still does shake. So, like you know, we did, we did build a, you know, a gap between the walls. We could have, in retrospect, I wish we made a larger gap because, like, that air gap is so strong when, you know, like, in designing like isolation from one room to the other. Like, that's that's really the biggest, easiest, cheapest uh, uh, benefit or uh, return on investment or whatever you call it. Like. If you have a double wall of any make, you know the more air gap you have, the better. <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. Um, you could you could build like a, a super expensive brick wall, you know, and fill it with sand and do all this sort of stuff, but it may not 
it won't have the same sort of isolation qualities of like a cheap stud two two cheap stud walls with like a 12 inch gap between them yeah. yeah and when in doubt rock stars um consider turning that air gap into a hallway or a storage area in your studio because that can be you get the double whammy of a huge air gap for massive isolation but you actually it's not wasted space yeah and it's also a good place to hide plumbing and duct work and all that sort of stuff and as long as it's not mechanically tying the walls together Right. I kind of learned, I learned that as, like when we were building electrical, I was kind of just starting and I was just watching and learning and everything and uh, learned a lot doing that. And when I built my studio in my old house, you know, I had to like make pennies go as far as possible. And so I, I like just building that room within a room for, I had two playing rooms in that studio. There's like, you know, pseudo live room for drums and a dead room that was a room within a room in that basement and building that room within a room and testing that sort of method out like it was really educational uh on how well that can work if you do it right and how I'd, yeah i'd be down there with a metal band playing and they'd have i'd have three roaring deafening amplifiers in that dead room and uh and i'd shut the hard you know the 200 hundred dollar Menard's hardcore door on one side and then shut the other hardcore door in the control room side. And when I did that, it was, it was like barely audible in this crappy basement studio. And, um, and I've been in million dollar studios that don't have that isolation just for whatever reason, like a shit happens and you have, you know, plans change and someone has to run something somewhere else. And that puts a big penetration through a wall. And all of a sudden you're 120 dB, isolation turns into 65 or something like that. But I had the luxury of building this place myself and I didn't like, I didn't have to accommodate someone's, you know, lighting scheme or. <laughs> you know, the, or yeah. Or somebody else's idea. Yeah. Now what about um, ventilation and air conditioning? Was that a, a challenge for you or did you find a way to just blow that off or how, how does that work? Um, in my basement? Or, yeah. Yeah. In the basement, uh, that's when I discovered the, the, wonders of like split air conditioner ac split mini splits were just becoming the thing to do in the u.s and i bought like an early mitsubishi mini yeah. air conditioner and it was like uh i did this when i built a studio in the basement for one of the blue man group original blue man group guys he was a drummer uh named jeff quay he's an amazingly awesome guy um but he built like a I built him a studio in his basement for him to rehearse and record in. And he was he was already sold on buying this mini split thing. I can't remember why. Um, and I was skeptical that it was gonna be quiet enough, but like he needed to have like some way to cool the space and he wasn't gonna duct in like a special air conditioning. So when when we got done building it, like they all you know, I saw how that was mounted, and the whole penetration through the wall is tiny, and all yeah. all the noise was basically in the compressor outside. And this was just like a little DC fan that was like you know, whisper quiet. And I was just blown away by that. So it, I took that and brought it to my basement studio. And for the dead room, that was just sort of uh, uh, there's nothing nothing ventilating that, and then I had a heating vent for the other playing room, but the the studio I built for this guy, the trick to get fresh air in there was he had an air purifier sort of fan outside of the room. And there was an eight inch flexi duct going to that. And what I did with that is like poke it in the exterior wall and stuff it zigzagging, uh, you know, maybe 30 feet in that wall and then poking out a, van, uh, a vent in the studio wall. And so air would be pushed in that way. And then, on the other side of the room, there'd be a, a register and another snaking 30 foot uh, insulated flexi duct. Um, and then it would snake for about 30 feet and then poke out the exterior wall. So, like the pressure is, the pressure would get leaked out by that. And there was no sound coming out. That was just something I just tried, hoping it would work. And it totally worked. I was prepared to build a plenum and have it sort of fill the plenum and then exit it, you know. Yeah. Just snaking. Yeah. And just that reminder, as you say about the pressure, we have to remember that if we use vented, duct, ducted um, air conditioning, if you're going to push air into a space, it has to exit somewhere else. It has to be a return. Yeah. 
and there's to let it out. This was that little weepy and like the ex the 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 exhaling of that whole system just went into the rest of the basement and you know it it worked out really well and uh there's another kind of heat exchanger kind of duct thing where as you draw cold air from the outside it sort of like pre-warms it up by ex- exiting air from an exhaust vent on the inside and it pre pre-warms the air on the way in so you have like you know if you're drawing air in from the outside world it's conditioned to the inside temperature a little yeah clever clever What do songwriters, music producers, DJs, EDM, TV, and film composers all have in common with you and me? We all crave captivating sounds that elevate our music to the next level. That's why Native Instruments is your ultimate creative companion, offering a vast library of sounds for your studio. Whether you're crafting hip-hop beats, indie pop melodies, classic rock anthems, serene meditation tracks, pulsating dance floor hits, or intricate orchestral compositions, Native Instruments Complete Bundle has you covered. From drums, loops, and beats, to dynamic synths, lifelike strings, and vintage instruments like electric bass, guitars, and keys, the possibilities are endless. Use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off, or download the free gifts waiting for you, like the awesome new Jacob Collier Audience Choir, and complete start featuring 2,000 sounds and 6 gigs of samples over at nativeinstruments.com. Well, I've, I've steered us far away from miking up a band, so um, give us continue your breakdown for a sec. Uh, is there anything else to say about Studio A at um, Electrical? Okay. You, I know you have the very big control room. There's Alcatraz, which is the dead room, Kentucky, which is the middle room, and then Centerfield is the very big room. Yeah. That, and, uh, and Kentucky and Centerfield have the Adobe walls. Yeah. So the for the Make Believe band, I had the guitarist um, out in the big live room, and I put a little uh, brick on the sustain pedal of the piano and just sort of mic'd up the soundboard of the piano. Oh, cool. In addition to his amps, he had a couple of amps that we spread him out on. And all the, most of the stuff that, most of the guitar on both those records is just him playing once. And there's a few overdubs, but he, his style makes it end with the bi amping and the room mics. It sounds like there's two or three guitarists playing at the same time just because he's, I don't know, he's like a crazy virtuosic, you know. Uh, guitarist and able to play like three guitarists at the same time um but the the piano trick i wanted to try just because uh, i thought it'd be i thought it like a little bit before but there wasn't kind of the right person this guy kind of fills up a lot of harmonic space so i think mm-hmm. okay these strings are going to resonate and might be kind of cool and i just recorded a track of that throughout the whole session and very occasionally like you know just at the end of a tight tight end of a song I just bring those tracks up and you'd hear like a sort of like a like a hum like a like almost like a you know computer starting up <laughs> sort of sound like, <laughs> you know, from it just like ring the chimes yeah and then the drums for that session were sort of two different setups that are kind of interesting he plays uh, a Wurlitzer it straddles the bass drum it just hovers right over the bass drum and he plays Wurlitzer while playing drums so oh wow if you hear electric piano that's that's him playing while he's playing drums and that goes to a separate amplifier. And uh, we set him up in the Kentucky room and you can kind of hear on the songs where there's like a decent sort of like normal room sound. Uh, That's him in the Kentucky room. And then for a couple other songs, we would set him up in the Alcatraz, the dead room, and then keep the door open. It's right next to the Kentucky room, the small live room. We'd have the door wide open and he'd be playing and I'd have a couple of room mics in the Kentucky room to be kind of a reverb chamber for his drums that are in the dead room. And so you have that really tight, close up dead room sound. And then this like almost like digital style, old eighties digital style reverb that sort of just comes in like a split second after the event. And I don't know, there's a lot of 
a lot of fun with that band because they're open. They were open to trying a couple different things, and and they're good enough musicians where it's like, you know, it'll take them one to six takes to get everything. <laughs> and yeah, I I have a similar thing um, at my place. So I have the dead room, which opens to the big. Um, I like to so. <laughs> Just just to give credit where credit's due, when I built my studio, I was like, dude, you, you can't just call it the live room and the dead room and the big room and the small room. Like, you got to be cool like electrical audio and, and Greg and Steve and, and give the rooms names. So, so I ended up calling my dead room the phone booth, the live room, the gallery, and then there's the loft and the kitchen is the other ISO room because it's actually a kitchen. Yeah. Um, so that's the best I could do. But if I record drums in the phone booth, um, I did the same thing. I, I mic'd up the drums and I was like, oh, what happens if I just open the doors to the to the gallery and ha- put the, you know, have a couple of room mics in there? And it was amazing. I was like, holy shit, that really like, you you can just turn those mics on and off and it goes from totally dead drum sound to sound of drums in a room. Yeah, it's kind of nice. Really, really remarkable combo. And it, and it has a quality to it that can't, you know, you could spend hours and hours and hours and hours scrolling through settings on a reverb um, to try to get, but like, it's one of those things. It's like, is this good or is it not good? And you decide, you know, pretty quickly if it's good or not good. And, <laughs> and usually it's- did you, um, did you find that you needed to move your live room, your Kentucky mics around to, for like um, phase no, not polarity against the drums or anything. Not really. Once you're like, you know, beyond that sort of 15 or 20 feet, um, you have like that natural sort of delay, that sort of satisfying, you know, 15 to 25 millisecond delay slap kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, not much bass energy was, he was playing drums facing like from the narrow part of the dead room to the wide part of the dead room, it's kind of a, it wasn't facing into doorway. So like the sound had to travel around the corner and get into the the Kentucky room. So it wasn't like he was facing right out the door and there wasn't much bass energy making it out there to, to get in conflict phase wise with the, you know, the source, you know, kick drum or whatever, Tom. Speaking of bass, does this band have a bass player? Yes. Um, And he's, he's like, he like plants the notes like strategically, like right with the. It's almost like him and the drums are the same entity. Um, he's very, very melodic and very simple and effective. Kind of Bobby Berg. He's you know an old Chicago amazing bass player and guitarist too. I think. But like, um, yeah, it's bass, guitar, drums, and vocals only. Like the vocalist Tim Kinsella is just doing vocals, just not playing any other instrument in this band. Uh, they broke up like a while ago, but... Uh, right after they made a record with you. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> right after, after working with me, the band broke up. <laughs> they tried it a few times, like, nah, it's not working, they broke up. No, but yeah, like, you know, uh, Joan of Arc, you know, it's been a, like, that's another Tim Kinsella project that sort of just weaves in and out of, you know, time. It's a constant sort of thing. And he, he and all these his friends like we'll have other sort of side projects and this was like a, a big side project i think it's not a side project it's its own band but like a um but it was one of those sort of in that family of friends that you know come up with that sort of that music community and uh they'd be touring like all the time like that was i think he even wrote a book about it too right on right on well um there's more records in your discography and um i'll, I'll keep going through them but let me see which one do I want to. Oh, here I'll just go to this. So, uh, Russian Circles, Geneva. Um, you know, it's got a huge drum sound with lots of compression. You can hear, and um, it, that one also has a bit of a chaotic, cool chaos going on with the cymbals and the swelling kind of wave-like quality to it. Um, so, I wanted to ask you, what are some ways that you set up your drum recording? Um, despite whether it's, you know, the chaotic cymbal kind of band or something, something different, but there's a quality in, in the drums that sounds, there's a consistency across your records 
that also gives sort of a three-dimensionality to the drums. They don't sound hyped up. They just sound they just sound cool like you just hear the power of the drummer in a space. And there's a three-dimensional quality to it too, which I really dug. Yeah, that's the uh, like um for that album he was set up in the big live room center field in Studio A. And that that was an example of an album that was I think uh we did things a little bit more separate, like uh they set up and track together playing live, but like, you know, we were focusing on getting the drums down. So like that was kind of the focus and and that frees you up a little bit to like, you know, use again, on the other rooms and other spaces. So for him, I know that like, there's always a chance that we'll have to get really close up and, uh, you know, there's a lot of like intricate hi-hat parts. And so I'd, I'd mic the hi-hat, which normally I wouldn't do. And mic other, other, moments make sure all the symbols can be like heard really well and not uh not do like the ballpark kind of miking where you know if he doesn't hit a thing hard enough it doesn't get heard it's like there's always a chance that like something will need to get like turned up later on so i'll mm -hmm. make sure i capture everything and then it would just be for that it'd just be like a set of overhead mics a mono kind of in front of the drum kit kind of compressed mic which at that time would have been either like a a ribbon or a condenser that had a lot of mid-range but not a lot of extreme top end what would be an example what's a condenser that comes to mind when you think of that um like a sony c37p which is a, a pretty dull sounding microphone compared to other yeah uh it's it's got like decent low mids and like doesn't just it doesn't hype the top end in the, the modern sort of condenser way and it's it's great for that sort of stuff and have you um have you found an equivalent in a modern mic um i'm trying to think that's always kind of my search is finding a full range unhyped condenser mic i feel like the soyuz microphones have that quality i mean there's a little bit of top end uh, clarity, but I don't think it's like as zingy as as a lot of other microphones. I'm trying to think. The Sony, I'm a big fan of all the Sony stuff. I wish they did. I wish they still made the C48. I would have, I would have bought like as many as I could find if I knew they were going to discontinue that one. That's that's like the most versatile mic in in my mind. But um, they do sell the C38, which is another. I think the C38 probably. C38B is probably the closest thing to that quality where it's not hyped and they got a good thick low end. Um, and I've heard, right I've heard the new, um, that new Neumann reissue of the uh, M47 is supposed to be like that, or M49 rather, is supposed to have that quality. I'd really love to try that thing out because I love that original mic. And if they're, if they're doing what they did with the, FET 47 remake and the U67 remake, I hope that this is similar. I know they can't get the tube, but they can still get close, I think. But yeah, the C C38B, that Sony mic is probably the closest thing that's convenient. For some reason, I started selling that again and took out the C48, but whatever. That's a great guitar mic as well. Okay, cool. Not, not necessarily the cheapest mic, but um, right. I just pulled it up on Amazon. Uh, twenty one hundred dollars on Amazon. Okay, you used to be able to get like those for eight hundred bucks, like the seventies version. Um, well, it's, it's our fault because we talk about them on podcasts, so that's worth oh, it. Well. I think I I heard the remake. I heard the new version of the C thirty eight, and it sounds it sounds exactly like I want it to sound. Whereas like the old one was kind of noisy at a low output and was kind of noisy because it was like you know nineteen seventies tech, you know, with phantom power, just like as as it's just a little bit noisy and it's a, it's not a, it's, it's known for having a really high, uh, you can, you can drill it with really high sounds and it won't distort. And my only complaint was like, it kind of had a lower output and was kind of noisy. And so the new one sounds dead quiet and I appreciate that at least. And so I'm just going to unconditionally recommend that microphone just cause I don't know. They're, they're right on. Um, so you would, Mike symbols individually, but you'd also have a stereo pair of overheads. 
Um, what, how do you describe the way to do that? What are the things we need to think about if we're going to put a mic on a symbol so that we can bring it up when needed, but it doesn't, but it sounds right, not wrong? Yeah, I wouldn't say I did every symbol, but I, I, I would have like a spaced pair of overheads. And then usually it'll be like a, some low hanging or low, low riding symbol, like a ride symbol. That'll be like quiet if it's a darker, heavier ride. If there's like a, um, if there's something sort of, you know, sheltered by the other symbols, I'll, I'll get something closer to that. And that'll be like, I don't mind having that being an obnoxiously bright sounding mic, like a AKG 451 or like an Audio Technica 4050, because that's kind of what I'm trying to get is just like that. It's, it's supposed to just get that thing. But for generic, like, you know, space pair overheads, I want those kind of like, I like having like full range uh, mics for that. Like, I'll, lately I've been using them, like Bayer Dynamic M160 ribbon mics, uh, just because it takes a lot of the edge off of the super highs. But um, mm-hmm. back then it might have been Shep's tube microphones, the 221 uh, microphones. The, uh, for him though, he, he does a great selection. He has a great selection of symbols and like, uh, I remember when we were doing that record, like they had had some success leading into that record. Um, and so he was able to get like better drums and better cymbals. And so, <laughs> so he, uh, came in with some great sounding like cymbals that weren't like excruciatingly loud. They're just really well tempered sort of cymbals that sounded good, but didn't, didn't destroy the rest of the drum kit, which was amazing. It sounds amazing. And so easy to mic up and so easy to record that kind of stuff because you can you can then use the room mics a much in a much more fruitful way because it's not just being like washed out by super loud cymbals, which a lot of like metally or loud bands, you have these deafening cymbals that just kind of like ruin everything. It's it's great in a club. They, like when when the drummer shows up and they have one of those bell cymbals, it's just, it just looks like an upside down ball. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, or they have the symbols where the the giant circles are cut out of them. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what those are supposed to be, but but the China, the the China crash. Yeah, yeah, all those. But even just like the uber loud crash, it's just you know it's geared for a live drum kit. So like you have your yeah, you're playing a club and and you got like your close mics on the kit part and then the cymbals just project on their own. And that, that is a really, that's a really good point to remind us of why that exists. And and when we do run into the drummer in our studio and we're struggling with cymbals, you make a great point, which is the reason why those cymbals are so damn loud is because they need to be on stage because they have to carry through the room on their own. Whereas, like you said, the drums on a stage kit are mic'd up and going through the huge PA speakers, you know, and getting all that extra boost. So it's uh, so it's perhaps designed to accumulate in the audience seat, sounding like it makes sense. Yeah. But in the studio, you're just like, the cymbal is like way too much against the rest of the drum and the, you know, for mics so close by, I guess. Yeah, and, and thankfully he hits the... He, thankfully he has a good sort of discipline about like hitting the drums at like a good, good velocity or I guess you would call it I hate that word for hitting hard <laughs> but like uh but yeah there's there's plenty of bands that I'll record where they do have the super loud cymbals or the hi-hat just sitting above the the snare drum and then they do blast beats or what have you and they're hammering the hi-hat and tapping on the snare drum and that's like the age old like quandary of a metal rock metal uh engineers trying to dig out that snare drum <laughs> like from uh, the high ha- hammering and that's where triggers probably come in come in handy yeah yeah get yourself a trigger otherwise you end up with like a with the you know snare drum well and it's funny you know it's like things sometimes for drums you know in all fairness to drummers it is the most complex instrument we're usually recording on a session. So there's a reason why it's gets a lot of attention and has challenges, but you know, there are those experiences where a drummer might not really know what the drums are sounding like until it gets recorded and it's under a magnifying glass and it's like, Oh, okay. Now I see what's going on with this, this part or you, you know, the drummer gets to the chorus. And if you really pay attention, you're like, 
you'll notice you're actually playing the snare quieter in the chorus. <laughs> so it's so the chorus is not really sounding more powerful than the verse because of that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And back to the digital versus analog thing again, like I've noticed that when drummers are playing with with the mindset that we're piecing this together to make a whole song, there's less there's much less intensity and in like and um you know it it feels like more like going through the motions and less like I'm playing this song. I want to play it as good as I can play it. I want to play it like I want to play it. I want it to be heard. Uh, it's sort of like more like, all right, let me just run through that part like six more times to see, you know, see what we come up with. You know? <laughs> and it's not like, it's not like they've been playing the song and then like passionately playing the final chorus, you know, because they played the whole song leading into the chorus. And, and that's like a, that's like a thing, a new a thing that no one ever thought about 20 years ago. It's just like, that's what they, of course you're playing the whole song. You're going to get to that point and you know where you are in that point. But now you have to sort of like, remember this is the final chorus and you're excited. So let's hit that final chorus and play excited. Okay. One, two, three, go. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Let me present to you our record that we stumbled into by accident. It's like, and then trying to, yeah getting this weird thing it's like ah it doesn't seem like it steps up in intensity like what can we do and heighten that artificially with faders (laughs) yeah do you ever feel like the time that you've spent watching youtube videos trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere have you been looking for a simple straightforward step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take you years to learn what if you could have a grammy winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them if you struggle with any of these questions then the ultimate mixing masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen to this quote from one of our students, David, quote, absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process that I've ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along along the way, but condensed into a six to seven hour session, close quote. Look, I'm so confident that this will take your mixes to the next level, that if you can't get a killer mix within 30 days, I'll give you a full refund, no questions asked. So if you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and start now by checking out the free preview of the ultimate snare mixing trick. And I'll see you at the front row table of the Grammys. Cheers. Okay, so Godspeed you, Black Emperor, Luciferian Towers. Deep, deep low end on that track. Um, talk a little bit about capturing deep lows in a, in a band like that. Um, how does using a console help or is it or or not be necessary with extension of frequencies in a recording? So that's a uh, that's a tricky band just because oh, there are two bass players, two drummers, three guitarists, and a uh, violinist who... They, just, uh, they didn't have the heart to kick anybody out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a commu- <laughs> snowball that accumulated people over the years. Now, it's it's basically been like that their whole lives and like or their whole career, plus or minus a few people. But like... Um, so right, because if they were born with two drums and two bass, I mean, that would just be... In the Guinness Book of World Records. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. I'd like to see that picture. I'm sure we could see that picture actually with the AI stuff. But that's right. Um, yeah, but so there's two two bass players and two. There's like a you know like a big marching band kick drum bass drum and and then a normal rock band kit kick drum, and they're all sort of competing for space. And then you know a couple of the guitars are also pretty low down there, like low mid heavy guitar sort of parts and. It, it, yeah, it's a it's a super struggle to carve out a space for everybody, and have the right mo- you have the right moments be heard, and and that's kind of the key. It's uh, there's like four people in that band that record music themselves, and 
a few of them, a couple of them own a studio up in Montreal and another person used to have a studio now lives in Germany. So there's like a, there's kind of a lot of cooks in the kitchen with that band. And I think part of the, part of the deal with me recording them or anyone else recording them is to have a sort of like a objective, un- disconnected person help with some of the, you know, decision making and, and sort of like picking and choosing what seems to be like the moment to feature. And I think that's, uh, otherwise I think it might just be like a, a slug fest, like, you know, trying to be heard. Everybody, everybody's doing something all the time, almost, and especially in some of the thicker moments in these songs. And so, so the mix really is a helpful part of the process. Yeah. So that's, that's really, there's only two speakers that all eight of them need to, that all eight of them have to come out of. And right. Cause you're not mixing an Atmos yet. <laughs> no. And hopefully I won't have to, although it'd be kind of fun, but, um, especially with that band. But yeah, so on some of the thicker stuff that, you know, no one's, there's always like some sort of feature that you can sort of pull out. And I don't know if, if it's intentional or not, but like, you know, you sort of draw, your your attention draws to a moment and you pull out these, these, these sounds that someone's making that seems kind of interesting for like a, a little bit of a moment and then have that hand off to another sound that someone else is doing but all at the same time it's all throbbing through and so sometimes there's an upright bass playing along with the electric bass and the two are different uh, but yeah they're occupying that same land and it's just it's just a careful you just have to like i don't know a, um, a lot of it, I kind of make it up as I go <laughs> on the fly. I don't have like a process to sort of excavate. It's it's just sort of okay. This is too too much. Who's who's? What are we trying to hear right at this moment? And we're trying to hear both these bases, but you can't like pan them left and right. There's maybe there's like a, a like constant thing happening in one base, and then a pokey thing in another base, and then things start to lean one side or the other, which kind of bothers bothers me, especially with low end. Um, mm-hmm. I love panning and everything, but when when something's like just grinding low end happening in like one ear, that can get kind of fatiguing. Um, right. So it sounds like when when presented with a a band that risks, you know, too much at once. The process sometimes could be useful to just let the band do its thing and then, you know, give yourself a little bit of space to to sort through it in the mix. And that is the right part, the right way to do a process like that. Yeah. So one of the, you know, one of the records uh, was like basically a 45 minute long song. And as they're playing these, as they're playing, I'm, making mental notes of things that uh, I find attractive of these specific moments. And it's all like everybody's contributing something, you know, in these dense moments. And like my, it's kind of like when you go on an airplane, for me, when I go on an airplane and there's the white wash of the jet sound and you're like Mm -hmm. half asleep and your brain starts sort of almost playing songs automatically, like in that jet wash white noise and you almost don't have to like think about a song. It's sort of playing automatically to you. I like when I listen to those sort of like, and I've done a, a few records where it's onslaught of sound. Uh, I kind of, my brain sort of finds a thing that I really like. And then, then it's just a challenge to not feature that thing too much. <laughs> and right, like I said, like hand it off to something else, like at, at a moment where that other thing starts to come into its own sort of like, you know, evolve into its own cool sound. And it's usually... Yeah, you sort of have to create your own dynamic. Yeah, it's, it's you sort of, you create a, you create motion. They're doing their own sort of motion and and, de- and swells and developing ideas. Uh, but there's also a way to, to make that translate on the record where it's not completely static, where you're just like, you're, you know, set up live and you're recording it live. Yeah. Or, or, and that's not a one brick at a time kind of session either. That's the band playing together. Yeah, the band's playing together, and uh, there'll be moments where, like you know, we'll do we'll do overdubs for sure. But like it's it's for the most like the core of everything is the band playing together. And then you know some people might like punch in a mistake here or there. But when we set up, everybody's in 
basically the same space with with some amplifiers, you know, with a little bit of isolation just for the sake of like, you know, being able to control sounds a little better, but not not to not isolate for the intent of like replacing everything. Right, treating it almost more like an ensemble, like a string section or something where you need to... So so then the room mics is an important part of getting the right sound. Yeah, so like that's a tricky thing because you have five, no, six amplifiers because the, the uh, violin goes through a pedal board and out another amplifier. So it's like six amplifiers filling that space um, and and then the drums and... It's it's a it's a trick to kind of like face things the right direction and have some baffles so that like there's a nice balance of you know things in the room mics and get the drums in a place in the studio we recorded at for that one can't remember there's like a there's a a bunch of booths that the amps were in but we would have the doors open so they could sit in front of the booth with their amp playing you could feel the amp energy hit them in the back while they're playing. But it wasn't like filling up the the room where the drums were like completely, so you couldn't use the room mics in the drum room. You could actually use the drum mics. I see. So that you'd have room mics for the drums, and then a little bit of the amps, just enough, sort of bleeds into that room too. But it's not overpowering. So, so the those are the room mics that might be um, getting a little bit of everybody and everything. Yeah, when you turn up those room mics, it's most drum, mostly drums, and then like you could almost just like high pass filter out the the blur of other the drones of other stuff going on um, um another band uh call me lightning soft skeletons that's got another huge bass deep deep bass amp sound yeah and i wondered if you want to talk a little bit about how you would have recorded yeah a, a bass like that that's the uh that's the drummer in that band was the guy i was talking about from milwaukee shane haas settler um but uh the bass for that i think he had an svt cabinet um and it, uh, talking about like gear that was set up to fill a club and not a recording studio i, I feel like that, yeah. that's great in a club and you can definitely play in lots of places that are have shitty pas and all that sort of stuff but in the studio that's kind of what i my my go-to when i see that come in is like oh hey do you mind if i just set up this 115 beats cabinet with a you know solid state trainer amp at the same time and usually they're fine with that and what that does for me is like fill in that mid-range gap uh that like the svt cabinet like tends to have on in the control room so the svt i'll capture that i'll capture the super low end from that thing with like a low end pickup mic like a microphone that is great for that, like a Biodynamic M380 or uh, even like a Sure Beta 52. It sounds like it, the good subs and the good lows, everything below 200 hertz basically get, just capture, you know, off of the SVT cabinet. And then I put a, you know, like basically a guitar amp mic in front of the trainer cabinet, which has got all that grindy mid range and low mid and high mid uh, region. And then the two blend the two together to come up with the bass sound. And then you have like sort of like a high and a low kind of blend. And you get that sort of like deep, deep Beechwood age bass from the SVT. And then like a, just the annoying nasally harshness of the trainer amp. And so that's, that's kind of like a lot of people come in with an SVT, not so much anymore, but a lot of like rock bands would come in with that giant SVT. And like it was always a, it was always like a, all right, how am I going to work around this fucking monster? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, it's just some funny things. One is, um, I love that you said the deep beach, beechwood aged bass. But um, an interesting thing to pay attention to is that the SVT 810 cab is actually eight 10 inch speakers that make up the bass cab. And that's where all the giant lows are coming from. And the place where you're getting mid-range is the Deets cab, which I actually, I bought one for my studio specifically because of working with you guys up there and oh, yeah. <laughs> and loving that sound. Um, and that's actually a 115-inch speaker right. with this ported. So it's sort of ironic that the, the low end comes from the one with the little 10s in it. But um, so when you set up the, the mid-range Deets cab with the trainer thing, uh, 
and and I, obviously we're not going to have the um, the matched thing in this. We, we might have our own version of all this stuff in our studios, but but I think we can understand what it's like to have a, a bass player come in and want to crank up their amp the way they do at normal. Like this is what I usually do, and sometimes you don't want to have to. You know, sometimes you don't want to try and convince the musician to do something they don't normally do. It's like, sure, do do your thing that you're comfortable with, but you also want to add what you need. So maybe you run it to something else. Um, with the Deets cab and the trainer, do you specifically try not to have much low end come out of that base camp no. base cab? You're no, I, I I set it up kind of like. Um... Yeah, it's kind of like the improv thing. Yes, and we can put this other amp here. Um, the uh, I try to get the full, like the full range trainer, you know, fifteen inch speaker setup going, as if that's kind of the, his only bass rig. Okay, all right. So it'll be like low end will be coming out of that. That's like that PV fifteen L speaker is just has a great kind of in my mind rock bass presentation. So it's got the lows and the mids and the highs. And uh, I'll set up full range and I'll usually sh- shove a a microphone that I love for guitar amps, like M- a Bayer Dynamic M88, which is one of my favorite mics for guitar amps. It doesn't have a lot of low end, but it gets a lot of that mid range and upper mid range. Um, that mic or even like a Sennheiser 421 type microphone uh, or like an EV RE20 or PL20 or you know, something, you know, that's going to get a lot of, a lot of the body, but not necessarily the subby side of the, the, the trainer 15 inch cab. Cause that trainer 15 inch combo can put out some subs, but not a ton of it. And, um, a lot of times I find that like over the course of like the session, we start favoring the trainer a little bit more and more, and it ends up being mostly trainer and or whatever the amp is and then like with the augmentation of the low end from the svt that ends up a lot of times being the the combination that ends up being mixed is trainer or the mid mid high end heavy kind of amp favored a little bit more with some like sub subby low end added by the svt um yeah it's like sneaking the um, training wheels off your kid's bike slowly, one little bit at a time. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not doing it like a deliberately. It's just like, I don't know. I guess I, I just haven't been satisfied. I don't think anyone gets satisfied when you try to mic the SVT up and you come into the control room and you're listening on bookshelf speakers and the bass player is like, that doesn't feel or sound anything like what I'm used to when I'm like standing next to this refrigerator that's shaking my bowels. <laughs> it's like... It's like, yeah, it's not going to sound like that in the control room. But like, like you, when you're playing that loud, you know how like your hearing compresses, like your hearing curve starts to compress and you start hearing the intricacies of the mid range and the high end. You hear that more detail, the louder things get. Like the bass sort of like isn't as loud, uh, comparatively speaking, to to those high end things. I'm so you're you're in the room with that SVT blaring and, and crushing, like in your practice space or even on stage. Like it may be deafeningly loud, low end, but you're picking up that mid range and high end uh, easier at that volume. But like uh, clinically, the bass is super is a lot louder than the the high end, and so like that's what comes across on a microphone and. and even if you mic it from a distance and you're trying to get the assembled sound of that whole cabinet, it's like, it's just the way your hearing compresses that frequency spectrum, you know, uh, it becomes more flattened out and you, you can hear some of the high end a little bit better, the louder it is. And, and I think, mm. that, I think that's the trick. Like they're, they're hearing that high end when they're playing live or when they're playing in the practice space. But if you shove a mic in front of it and then play it back at a, at like stereo volume, all that you're really hearing is the low end coming out and you don't, you don't get that sensation. So like, it's just a matter of trying to recreate that, um, in the control room, that, that sort of like clarity and presence that they have when it's like deafeningly loud. Um, do you have time for another, another question? Of course. All right. Um, I'm going to jump to guitars real quick. Guided by voices, earthquake glue. The guitars sound great. They're also kind of bright, but it doesn't sound like EQ got us there. 
So I wondered if you wanted to talk about uh, your mic choices for guitar amps. Um, do you sometimes select bright mics or condensers for guitars as well? Um, and what, what are some thoughts there about getting a great guitar sound? Um, I found, uh, I found the more guitars there are, the less full range, less full range. I like to get them. So like if, if people are just like, if you're in a crowded space and you're fighting for attention, uh, I feel like that's when like you, you sort of have to ditch some of the more low end heavy microphones. Um, if it's just a power trio, like three piece band, like um, you can afford the space of having like a full, rich uh, guitar sound um, with multiple mics, capturing like all the elements of what's coming out of like a cool sounding guitar amp. Um, and you, you'll have room to play it all. You'll have room to mix it all in there. But when there's multiple guitars playing, it's, it's you know, then you start, you know, you start and trying to carve the space out for those, 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 uh, amps and it's just a little bit easier to do to cut away at the the low end i don't know if i did that deliberately for that song it's been a long time but like i know that i do that when it's like a cluttered kind of group of amped instruments or guitars and and just to have someone have a space for themselves like having that low mid region like the 100 hertz to like 400 hertz have that like be less represented you know helps out a lot um and that's something that's happening. Is that coming out of the amps and hit and coming through our mics and then we're having to deal with it, I think it at EQ? Or is it something that we just try and get smarter about not having it come out of the amp in the first place? Um, for them, that was like an interesting session that they were at the end of a tour that they wrote this song and they wanted to quickly put it on the record before the record came out. Um, and so they're like, they're like in tour mode and super tight and, and it was like a, a one day sort of session so there was i wasn't gonna i wasn't gonna tell them how to i wasn't gonna redo how they have their guitar sounds they like they, they come they've been playing for like 80 years or something like that so they know what they want <laughs> they know how to like it so uh for the most part i'll put like a microphone like that might have you know the eq characteristics that i want you know, to augment as opposed to trying to turn down the bass. Sometimes, I'll, you know, other bands will sculpt the sound coming out of the amplifier, but um, it's easy to just pick a microphone that just favors, high, you know, like the frequency range you like. So if I wanted to do so, heavy one, I'd use like one of those older Sony C37s or a ribbon microphone. And then in this case, it might've been like something more like a RCA BK5 or M88 that, you know, enhances, but doesn't like, pinch the high mids like a like an sm57 would it's you know you just have the full range but at a upper top end kind of presentation as opposed to like you know you know just a pinched mid upper mid range frequency um when you say pinch do you mean like the sm uh the 57 yeah gives us the upper mids but we don't have the way highs and we don't have much in the lows yeah and it's it seems i i don't know I don't remember what the EQ curve is, but it feel I feel like it sound it has like a like a really tight bandwidth like peak uh, somewhere in the you know upper mid range like three to seven k kind of area or something like that. Mm. As if he like turned up the EQ there and then and narrowed the Q on the EQ. Um, that's what I that's what I think is pinched. Like the snare sound on a fifty seven is like it's like perfect. It's just like it's like sharply focusing in on this crack kind of scenario. That works great for live, you know, sound and all that stuff. But and on, on a guitar amp, if you listen to it to a listen to that next side by side to another dynamic that's a little more full range, like a like a you know M eighty eight or four twenty one or SM seven, like you can hear how exaggerated that EQ pinchiness is on the fifty seven. This podcast is proud to present Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, 
then check out Rock Stars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I master my own records using nothing but plugins. Plus, I take you into a world class mastering studio, Sterling Sound, to meet with Ryan Smith and hear how he professionally mastered my record, Skadoosh, for release to streaming platforms. That's the music you hear on this podcast, Rock Stars. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free mixing course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even upload to your website if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy to get started now. Why do I reach for the high-end EQ on a snare, a 57 on a snare so much? Yeah, I was just down at uh, Matt Talbot's studio and outside of Champaign and Tolano. He's got a studio. He's like guitarist and singer from home. Uh, he, he, you know, we were just recording some demos and like we were talking about how we just have a craving to turn up the high frequency on snare drums and trying to find the right mic to capture that. I think it's just recreating that sensation, kind of like the SVT, where you're like you're standing in front of the drum kit, and when someone hits the snare drum, you have that like wince reaction. It's like so so bright and so loud that it causes that wince reflex. And when almost the opposite from the bass amp situation, when you come into the control room, a lot of the microphones don't capture that like intense transient perfectly. And it doesn't come out of the speakers perfectly. And it's like you don't have that wince moment because it's coming out at 70 dB as opposed to 130 dB or whatever it is when you're standing in front of it. Yeah. And so like the quick and easy thing is like, oh, I, let's turn up that that treble to make that crack, get that crack in there. And um, uh, and so you kind of just... I, I like the crack. I like the crack and the body. And I like heroin. And so I want all the three to work together. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, and you, get, and you don't want to wait till you're seventy something either. Yeah, I wish I could take heroin now to get to the age of seventy and forget about between now and seven. No. Anyways, the microphone that seems to work really well for like that crack, that like super high end transient crack. We found it. I well, Steve showed me this when I paid attention to him. Um, it's an Altec 175 tube microphone. It's like a cathode follower tube microphone, which means it can take a punishing level. And it, it just happens to have like a really high frequency, sort of like good response. Like and it seems to get that wince factor if you turn up the control room volume, you know, to a suitable level. But but yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, I feel like a lot of people are wanting that from for a lot of rock music too. Yeah. Um, well, I think in the past we talked about, um, we have talked with Steve and I think you about some of the things that you guys would do occasionally at um, at electrical where it's like there's maybe a pair of room mics down on the floor out in front of the drum kit and, and maybe they get a little bit of delay added to them so that you get that kind of wide zing factor on the yeah. on the loud snare hits. I, th- I Steve... Tends a, uh, I mean, his explanation for why that seems to work, and I've heard it. Like I've, you know, I've gone to these like weird recording seminars where we sort of do these tape session demo things, and I've heard him explain it a few times. And it's it's good and accurate. Like you're delaying things, so like you're getting past this sort of comb filtering uh, zone with with some of the drum mics blending together in a bad way. But I think it's a lot more simple than like some of the more complicated explanations like he you know he'll put those pzm when they put an omni mic on the ground on a floor or a long surface it's a pressure zone microphone basically a pzm mic and it, mm-hmm. it's a great full range omnidirectional pickup um and typically he'll have those a pair of those on the floor you know four to eight feet away from the drum kit and then he'll delay that they'll delay those microphones about 20 milliseconds and it and it puts that signal those those floor mic signals beyond the sort of the comb filtery problem of having a, a, a smattering of pickups of someone hitting a snare drum hitting six 
16 different microphones at the same time. Um, my, in my mind, what, what it's actually doing is, is, uh, sort of emulating what the drummer is hearing. So like when you sit down at a drum kit in a fairly live room and you start playing, you're hearing yourself bounce off the opposite wall and then reflect back upon you. And whatever that distance is in a normal room, you know, if you're 10 or 15 feet away from the walls, you know, so that's 30 feet, you know, the sound travels like 30 feet on its way back to you when you hear that like reflection and it's got that cool sort of delay and everybody sort of knows that sound when they play drums in a live-ish room, they feel that sound and usually it sounds really cool. And so by delaying those PZM microphones, you're basically recreating that experience. And I've sort of developed a way to kind of get that sensation, but also get kind of the low end cohesive. I mean, obviously it's Steve's records speak for themselves and they sound awesome. Like the drums, you know, are usually pretty great sounding and, you know, it's known for that sort of sound. Um, but like I, I want to have, or what I've, what I've gotten to the point is like getting two cardioid microphones and putting them sort of on the floor facing the opposite wall. And a cardioid microphone isn't perfectly directional. Like it's, it, as it gets lower in frequency, the pickup pattern becomes more omnidirectional. Mm-hmm. When we're like under under 100 hertz, it's basically an omni microphone. And so if you have a cardioid mic facing away from a drum kit, um, it'll pick up most of the action bouncing off the, ra- the walls and g- coming back to the microphones while rejecting the initial drum kit. Uh, but the kick drum and the toms, all that low, inf- low frequency information will hit that room mic and the room mic will pick it up and it'll be you know, roughly on par with like the overheads or a close sort of room mic. And so that can be an additive sort of feature of that miking situation. And if it isn't, you just roll off the low end. <laughs> and so right. but you have that natural... Like sometimes if you do the 20 milliseconds delay thing, you hear like a flutter of like kick drum and that always bothered me. And I was always like, okay, mm-hmm. this is like a cool thing. This is a cool sound, but I don't like the way like there's a little, little flutter noise with like the kick drum and how can I stop that from happening? And this is like the way I came up. When I, when I want to emulate that sort of sound, that, that's, this is the way I've come up with that sort of. Um, yeah, because the low end of the drum would be cohesive with the close mic. Yeah, like the, but then the because the directionality of the con- cardioid is pointing towards the far wall, then the highs and the mids sort of have come to come to the mic a moment later as they bounce off the wall and come back into the mic. Yeah, so you have that slap back effect that everybody likes when they sit down and play a drum kit in a room. That's kind of the that's kind of the neat feature of that. But uh, right on. Well, um, let me go to a closing question here. Greg, uh, this one is hypothetical, and I've asked you before, but it was a long time ago. It was like, like, like guided by voices. It was like about eighty years ago. I asked you this question, so I'll ask you again. It's hypothetical. We're going to take the way back studio machine, and you get to go back in time and find young Greg. Um, maybe he's just getting into. I don't know. I don't. I forgot what your first stuff was. Four track recorder, probably right. Yeah. And um, and you go back and give yourself a bit of advice. You say, here's the single most important thing you need to know to become a rock star of the studio yourself. Ooh. What advice do you want to go back and give yourself if you could? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, now that you asked that question, I, I wonder if I said the same thing, but I wish I... Oh, a couple of things that are... Hey, you never, hey, if you say it again, it just means it's that important. Right. <laughs> it's, maybe it's a universal truth. Like... Kind of like I wish I were taught a uh, foreign, like a second language at, before I could say no. I wish I was made to learn, like made to learn like the piano uh, from an early age. And even if I like hated it and rejected it, like I wish I was forced from like age seven to whenever I fought enough about it to quit it. Um, I wish I just had that sort of background. And I think like, so if I like bumped into myself when I was starting to get into audio, which is probably like a, uh, when I was 14 years old, maybe 14 or 15, probably because of the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and started getting into that stuff. Uh, 
I would just, if I could convince myself that anything was important, it'd be kind of like, no, oh, you should take piano lessons. It'd be kind of handy. And I think it would be handy. It's not like I've suffered because I, 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 I haven't suffered because I don't know piano, but I think it would have been handy to like be able to just sit down and play stuff out. And, and I, you know, obviously I don't have a passion for it. Otherwise I would have done it <laughs> by now, but that's, that would be, that would have been uber handy for Greg Norman at 14 years old, like for Greg Norman at 25 years old and 20 eight years old like i would have been handy to know just you know yeah uh, but that being said i haven't forced myself to do it now and i know better <laughs> so well the piano is such a wonderful instrument too because it really is um i mean it was invented as a simulation of an entire orchestra in a way you know it's like because it's got the low lows and all the way up to the highs so it's it's the full arrangement of what's possible, yeah, melodically and sonically. Um, That's it. Well, I shouldn't say sonically, but melodically. You know, the n- n- no choice in arrangement wise. And so, as we understand and learn the piano, it really does help us understand what's going on with notes and where they go together and all that kind of stuff. And there's no better instrument for communicating ideas, uh, like in a moment's notice, too. Like you can't even on guitar, you can't really do it. Um, as well as you know, just sitting at a piano and working out certain ideas and and, and riffing on stuff like you know it's it's like it, it'd be handy to know like it, it's not like a it's not like a make or break thing it's just uh, well you're talking about showing a harmony idea and it's like you know you use melodyne on a double and move it over right. but um <laughs> a piano can be a great way to find harmonies too and uh a reminder that on a guitar, there can be multiple locations for the same note. On a piano, there's one location for that note. So those are, you know, two real differences. Um, And then another thing I realized recently was, uh, and my brother tried to explain it to me. He tried to say, he's a pianist. I was, I'm guitar first. And he was like, man, guitar voicings are so massive. And I was like, really? I never thought about that. You just here's an E chord. You just strum it, you know, what's massive about that. And then I, I went to go learn one of my guitar riffs on the piano and you realize you're like, Oh shit, you really got to go across like two octaves to do something that was pretty damn easy, easy to do on a guitar, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, Greg, thanks. Thanks for hanging with us again, man. Let the rock stars know, where would you like them to go? Uh, check out more of your stuff. Um, what if they're ready to come record their next record and they just want to reach out to you? Um, the easiest way to get a hold of me is there's two ways. Just going to like my website, normaphone.com, uh, which I put together in a, about three hours. It's a really, really extravagant website. And then um, Electrical Audio um, on the staff page there. And I think you can just click on my face, you know, you know email to prompt shows up and or you could just contact the studio. But yeah, that's, those are the two easiest ways to get a hold of me. And um, other than that, like there's a phone book probably still being made. If you look up an old phone book and contact my sister who might be in it, and then she could get a hold of me and or send an email to... I'm making up stuff as, as much as I can now. But anyways, yeah, it's Studio Electrical Audio and normaphone.com. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, was, I remember the... Uh, the page of you at Normaphone is like, is is Greg the light? Is the light on shining on Greg or is Greg shining on the light or something like that? Someone wrote that in there. I didn't I didn't write that in. I think a lot of like stuff when we rebuilt the website, uh Taylor, who did most of the work, thankfully, and we owe him a debt of gratitude. Taylor's the office manager and engineer and the guy who's been doing most of the transfer work at Electrical recently. Uh he uh sort of like did these place placeholder filler things and yeah <laughs> some of them are pretty funny yeah they held their place for 80 years yeah at least 80 <laughs> um dude great to hang with you man rockstar thanks for listening and greg i look forward to uh, running into you again soon yeah thanks a bunch i'll, I'll hopefully see you next time I'm in uh nashville 
Thanks so much for listening to the Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our awesome sponsors who help make this episode possible. Lewitt, Grace Design, Adam Audio, Native Instruments, and Isotope. And remember, at isotope.com and nativeinstruments.com, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase. If you enjoyed recording Studio Rockstars, please check out our sponsors using the links in our show notes because it's a great way to help support the show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wessel. Chenko, Braden Streming, and Liz Hulitskaya. Thanks so much for listening, rock stars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.